Hello, audience. One sec, I'm just gonna check, make sure my mic's... Okay, we've got the right one. Cool, okay. So welcome to our world building stream. Wow, could I have said that more awkwardly? So, the goal for today, as I promised in our D&D Semba announcement video, was we're going to stream at least twice this month. Um, maybe more, we'll see. Let's stick with what's possible. Um, first, we're going to start today by creating a starting town. Now, what I want to do with this stream is to try and do as much of it as I can using just randomized tables, which they provide a lot of in the DMG. So we've got, we just got to create one NPC for now, which will be our bad guy, and then in the process we'll also make a starting town. So we'll see how far we get. If we got to stretch this out into a second stream next week, then we can. Um, yeah, let's see how it goes. So, I'm going to... I don't have an overlay for this one, so it's going to be a little jank, but it'll be fine. So let's... Hey, not too bad. Uh, so what we're doing is... You're welcome to follow along in your own DMG. I would have put a PDF of it up on the screen, but I feel like that's not all good with Wizards of the Coast. I feel like they probably won't look too kindly upon me just being like, Ah oh yes, here's some pages of your published book. But we're starting on page 94, and we're going to find out what our bad guy's motivation is. So on our window here, we've got lovely webcam taking up a quarter of the screen. Good stuff. Uh, we've got our WordPad document and our dice roller, because I would have used physical dice, but I don't have a camera for that, so we're using Google Dice. Okay, so first, we're going to find out what our villain's goal is. So this is their scheme, and let's see, first we got to roll a d8 and determine what they want. Two. Alright, so I'm going to put these all into subheadings. Scheme. We don't even know who this villain is and what uh, and what their intention is. We're going to discover it. Maybe they'll be a vampire, maybe they won't be. Their goal is influence. So they're looking for... Well, it's different to power. So let's see. Influence, and then there's a subheading. They want to... Roll a d4. Four. They want to... Interesting. Hang on. They want to place a pawn in a position of power. This is actually quite interesting. I'll bring this up now because it's on the topic of world building stuff. Um, I'm read. Um, well, reading is the wrong word. It's more listening because I'm on the audiobook of uh, Discworld, uh, the book Guards, Guards where there is actually... the villain of that narrative is doing this. Um, he's, he's, like, trying to work with this secret scheming, like, cult to summon dragons so that he can supplant... like, so they can put his own king up on this, ma like, new throne of uh, Ankh Morpork. So basically he wants to have, like, a toady in position um, as king that he can just boss around and he has ultimate power over. So that's our villain's goal. It's actually quite ordinary. Like, in comparison, we've got immortality, magic, mayhem, passion, power, revenge, wealth. But no, this guy is, I think, a more humanized villain. So his goal is a little bit more political. But what are his methods is an important question. So how is he going to get what he's... How is he going to place this pawn in a position of power? Let's find out. 13. So, if you're following along, page 95 of the DMG. 13 is... Okay. How is he going to do it? Ladies and gentlemen. Methods. This one doesn't even have a second roll. Neglect. <laughs> I don't know how he's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to get into a position of power by kind of doing nothing. Um, it's possible that maybe he's... Um, he, he, she, they, uh, this villain, like, 
for all we know, they already have a position of power, like as an advisor to the current king, monarch, sovereign, president, um, and their goal, and they their goal is they just won't act. Who knows? But our villain has a weakness. Let's find out what the villain's weakness is. Now, this does not necessarily mean like, you know crucifixes, holy water, it could be something, uh, more, uh, you know, more character flaw. Uh, we need a d8. A 1. Interesting. Okay. A hidden object holds the villain's soul. Okay, so that's curious. So it could be that this person has bargained away their soul with a devil. It could be that they're a lich. You know? This is something we can work with. So we can come back to that stuff later on, once we have our location to play in. So let's find out. We need to scroll a bit through our book. Now that we have sort of a core idea of this character, we need to find the town. So, our settlement... So this is on page 112 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. So, we need to find out what is the deal with this town. So, random settlements. This, the following tables assume uh, allow you to quickly create a settlement. They assume you've already determined its size and basic form of government. We have not. So we're going to kind of create you know, like, roll up these stats, and then, not stats, but roll on these tables and see what we get. Maybe we'll decide it makes sense for it to be a very big, uh, big settlement, like a whole city, or maybe it's more of, like, a sort of outpost, or, like, a crossroads. Um, as for its basic form of government, we can do a fair bit with that at this point. It could, with our villain scheme, we could go for something, you know, more traditionalist, like a monarchy... We could do a democracy, or we could even do like something more interesting, like a majocracy, or a, um, you know, something more fantastical. This is a fantasy world, after all. We can, we can do whatever we want with this. Our villain could be a guy, or a vampire, or whatever we want. Uh, so let's see. What is, first table, race relations? So, first up, we have a four. So... We start with race relations, so this is like what the humans think of the dwarves, and a 1 to 10 is harmony. So dwarves, elves, halflings, dragonborn, whatever we've got, living in peace. The ruler's status. So this will be interesting, this will kind of determine what our villain's doing and how neglect will get them what they want. So, ruler's status. Okay. We need another d20. A 15. Okay. Our villain is a dol... Dold. Is a doltish lout. Okay, so maybe public approval isn't very high. Maybe people look at this person and think, My, they're an idiot. Maybe the villain will get them killed just by doing nothing, and has already planned uh, for someone to step in. Uh, next up, we have notable traits. What is the deal with this town? And this might even um, in, this might even inform the dungeon that we get later on. Um, so in the next stream, we're going to be making and trying to draw. Hopefully, if everything works out right and I can get working. We're going to be drawing a dungeon that could even be part of this. So if, like, let's say our notable trait is I roll a 20 or a 19, we could end up putting it in the city. An 8! Okay. So a notable trait this city has... is it is the headquarters... Forgive my terrible typing. Uh, headquarters of a powerful family 
or guild. Now, of course, if we don't like any of this, we can swap it out, because we're the DM, and this story has to be fun for us, too. <laughs> you know, we might decide that it is more interesting for, you know, a racial minority oppresses the majority, or for the, ruling mon uh, for the ruler to be a feared tyrant. We might decide to change some of these. But for now, that could be quite fun to see, uh what the city does if perhaps the um, the mages guild or the potters guild holds a particular particular uh, amount of power in this city or sway in this region is my microphone blowing out i think it is i'm just going to turn that down a little bit uh, advanced audio properties let's put it down to boost by 3.8 there we go that hopefully will look a little better Okay, so after notable traits in this town, we have... It is known for its... Another d20. A 19. 19 is... It's known for its... Strong drink. People will travel far and wide to taste their... What's the name of, like, a really potent, like, spirit? What what would be a cool fantasy name that we can come up for that? Once we have a town name, or even we can name the town after it. That could be interesting. I'm just going to turn my audio down a little bit more so I don't keep blowing it out. There we go. It's on the fly. All my settings have been changed since I upgraded my computer. <laughs> Fresh install of OBS. We're working from scratch. It's a wonder any of this works. Um, okay, so, our current calamity. So what is going wrong with the city? What is the... What could be giving the villain what they want? How can neglect get them what they want? You know, perhaps this is more of an anti-hero or anti-villain type character. Where, uh, by doing nothing, they might get what they want. That might be the intent. They might be a reluctant villain. So, our current Calamity is another d20. A 16. 16, on page 112, gives us... Interesting. Internal strife. Brackets. Leads to anarchy. Okay, so we're starting to paint a picture here. So perhaps our villain is an advisor, or, um, or or some person with power, with like a seat near power themselves. But they don't want to be the face for it. They don't want to be the monarch. They don't want to be the sovereign or the president or whatever they're trying to overthrow. Their goal is to uh, is to place someone into that position and then be the puppet master. We could even play with a demon here. That could be fun. And with internal strife leads to anarchy, so that tells us that if he does nothing, if no if nothing intervenes, and if things go with their current trajectory, they will fall into anarchy. I'm picturing maybe even a chaotic character here, so maybe even a demon uh, more than a devil. Okay. We have random buildings, so let's find... Why not? Let's make a building, and that might inform what this drink is. If let's let's roll up a tavern if if we don't get one. But first up, building type. Roll a d20. A seven. A seven is a residence. So let's go buildings. And so we have a residence. I do I do think a tavern would be a good idea. I think that would be a really good idea. If I'm looking off screen, it's because I have a second monitor here that's got my everything on it. So, <laughs> just follow along. Um, okay, so so we need a residence. So we roll on a residence table. So this is a good thing. This is a kind of table you can pull out for like if you need to populate the space. So let's see. We have another d20, a seven. So our residence is a middle class home. So this might be an important building um, to our plot. 
perhaps some uh, something is important here, and we can find out what that is in our narrative. So we have a middle class home. Okay. So that's going to be of some import. Let's give it another. So, I want a tavern. Just because this place is known for its strong drink, I want a place that serves that drink. Uh, tavern? So, let's roll another d20. Thirteen. This important tavern is an upper... Upper class dining hub. And now, what is this upper class dining hub called? Once again, d20. We roll two d20s here, so the first part is the laughing. The laughing. The d20. 12. The laughing spirit. Okay. So, the Laughing Spirit serves whatever strong drink this is. So we can tie these together. And it could even... I mean, Spirit just makes sense. Maybe it's called Laughing Spirits. Who knows? Gives you the giggles. It's like laughing gas. So, I am happy with that. And from here we've got Encounters. So what I'm going to do is double back a little bit. And we're going to work out who some of our core NPCs are. So do that. I'm going to switch back to our villain for a moment and decide on some of their stats. And this could even inform like what kind of monster we use. So, more importantly, well, less important. I think the most important thing here is what they intend to do. But, what do they look like? So, appearance. So we've doubled back on the NPC uh, to now the NPC tables, which is a little bit before where we've got villain. And what is like a notable piece of uh, of their attire or their appearance? Roll a d20. A three. Interesting. They wear flamboyant or outlandish clothes. So I'm starting to picture maybe they are a um they are some someone like well to do. They are a member of high society or perhaps I have a character in a friends game who is a member of very low society who is like gro uh, a sort of dwarvish uh, swashbuckler character who is very much grown up in in like the bottom rung of society and grown up very poor. So he dresses very uh, ostentatiously and flamboyantly in bright purple colors. Um, with, like, sort of trinkets and medallions all over himself, and, like, really tries to draw attention to, and and bigs himself up in a large way. He calls himself, uh, he calls himself Sir Dolren. He's, he was, uh, he's never officially been knighted, and he, and the answer for who knighted him changes every time. Um, let's see. Next up, we need his abilities. So here we're going to roll two d6s, and the first one will determine their high stat, and the second will determine their low stat. First up, a six. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay. High stat. And if you're familiar with the D&D &D character sheet, you already know that their high stat is Charisma. So high Charisma makes them persuasive. Forceful. A born leader. Okay. Now their low stat. Okay, we roll again, a two, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting, it goes against sort of player archetype, 
but their low strength is dexterity. Low dexterity makes them clumsy, fumbling. I have a paladin who's got a very low dex, and that manifests in the way that he is, uh, he is pr like he's a high strength, high charisma character, but he's prone to picking up things and breaking them. Um, he tends to pick up. He t uh, he's he's a bit of a like. Uh, he's got a criminal background and uh, tends to accidentally, st I, I do mean accidentally, steal things. He'll pick up small trinkets and then just pocket them unknowingly. He just kind of takes things, and because he's a big, high charisma, high strength, menacing guy, sometimes he doesn't notice he's stealing things and people don't follow up on it. So it's just kind of this uh, trait he has where he just slides things off desks. Maybe this character is prone to breaking things. Maybe they're prone to just knocking things over as, um, you know, has like a very strong force of personality, but tends to like fall over themselves. You know, maybe that's why they want to uh, be, you know, lead, have a pawn in a position of power, but not be the leader. You know, why they want to have someone in that position of power instead of them. Maybe they think they can persuade Huh? See? Persuade that person into, you know, doing what they want, but without actually taking the limelight and embarrassing themselves. They could even be a high-strength character. Like, they could... Charisma is their highest stat. I'm just going to roll the d20 anyway. Nope. It's another... Okay. Yeah, it could even just be that you know, charisma is their highest, but they still have other stats that can be high and low, so we can make them very highly intelligent, or just, you know, good intelligence, provided we lean on the fact that their most powerful ability is their charisma. So if we want to make this person even a spellcaster, we could. We could make them a sorcerer, we can make them a paladin, we could make them a warlock. I think a warlock could be interesting. I always kind of like warlock villains. But let's continue on. So I'm going to do one of these little numbers because these are the secondary field. This is what they want. This is who they are. So they have a talent as well. So what is a thing this person is good at? This is a d20. Five. Oh, curious. This person is great with animals. Maybe even... Ooh, I'm thinking of my Waterdeep campaign now where you've got... A, there's a couple of, like, noble houses with collections of exotic animals. Like, you've got, a, you know, a family that catches monsters. You've got a group that, um, that trains griffins. So maybe this person has, like, a griffin... You know? Maybe there's some sort of, like, fantasy Joe Exotic. <laughs> Alright. Mannerisms. So this is more something for those at the table trying to play this character. I'm gonna roll another d20. You know, something you can fall back into. Interesting. You, I say that a lot today. Interesting is the word of the day. But it's fun. Like, rolling on random tables, you can get some really cool and unexpected things happen. You know, like, you can pick... You know, if you just pick the last entry on every table, you'll probably even wind up with an even crazier character. Like, some of these times, especially when we get to um, the dungeon, you'll see, like... 20 means the dungeon is on the back of a titan, or something like that. There's some crazy stuff out there. So if you want to pick, like, what if this character is one in every table? What happens? So this character, what was it? 10? Uses colorful oats. With, with a U, because, hello, I am not American, like the printer. Use colorful oats. 
and exclamations. By Moradin's beard! In one sentence, describe how the NPC interacts with others using the NPC interaction table, if necessary. Can change depending on who it is. Okay, so let's go interaction. So let's say this will be like their dominant trait, let's say. And normally this is like you can change it with whoever, but let's say this is who they kind of are. Yeah, their primary. Primary mood. And this is a D12. Oh, you never get to roll D12s. A 1. Argumentative. Useful knowledge. In, in a sentence, describe one bit of knowledge the NPC possesses that might be of use to the player characters. The NPC might know something as banal as the best inn in town, or something as important as a clue to, uh, needed to solve a murder. There isn't a table for this one, so we'll continue on. Uh, NPC ideals. We'll just we'll scrub NPC. We know he's an NPC. We're not playing this character, although you probably could use this to inspire you if you wanted to. Is that a magic quest? Do -do -do. Ideals. So... Hmm. We already determined that they are... Well, no, we didn't really determine that they're chaotic, did we? This is kind of where we might have to start making a few decisions. So I kind of think... So we can choose a good ideal, an evil ideal, lawful ideal, chaotic, neutral, or just other. Um, I'm going to roll once on evil and see what we get. Six. Their evil ideal is slaughter. I'm gonna roll it. Uh, I'm gonna roll another, and see what we get for chaotic. Four. Independence. You know what? I'm gonna go with the chaotic one on that. I I think that's not bad. I think we can do a bit with that trait. Then we have a bond. So a bond is a connection that the NPC, in this case our villain, has to a person, a place, the world, um, an object. Let's find out what that is. Ten. Their bond is... <laughs> Roll twice. Okay. So they have two bonds. Their first, we'll put these like as a sort of order of importance. Forested Druid. Hello, for, uh, Forested Druid. I'm doing good. A little bit sick, so hopefully that doesn't come through. But other than that, I'm doing good. How are you? So, our first, so let's call this their primary bond. We'll call that number five, captivated by a romantic interest. Now, notably, one of the most import, uh, important uh, notable villains in D&D history is captivated by a romantic interest. Count Strahd von Zarevich is obsessed with, um, you know, his brother's... Uh, love, so it's always possible we can roll with that. And his next, his secondary bond, we'll say, is he's pro he, she, it is protective of close family members. Okay. I'll just put like a and uh, there we go. So we know they're both tied to it. We'll also do the same over here. And 
a little boop. Something they hold dear. Exactly. So we've got... Oops, sorry, I've just banged the mic. Gosh. Um, so now we've got their bonds. So they... They're smitten with a romantic interest, and that is the thing they care about most. So they want some person. You know, whether, the, uh, whether that person thinks the same, who knows. The second is they are protective of their family. Very good, just I'm playing in a one-shot. Oh, am I doing... I think I might have that thing I had last time playing Wildermyth where my stream is way behind. Hopefully not. We'll see. <laughs> so they're protective of close family members. It's also possible that they are this powerful family or guild. It's maybe they already have quite a lot of sway in the city. Maybe that's who their sort of, uh, pow you know, their powerful family is. They're protective of it because they have influence. Now, of course, we have... This one is always good. Flaws. And in this case, secrets. So what is their downside? I played as a dwarf nature cleric. Ooh, I've always wanted to dabble with nature cleric. I like, um... I like Ancient's Paladin. That's fun. It's got, like, a very similar sort of feel to it, but... I, I would like to try some of those, because I've never really been drawn to Druid, but I love Clerics. So Nature Cleric really does it for me. But I haven't ever played one. I've played a few brands of Cleric. Um, some better than others. <laughs> I think Death and Arcana are not great, and I have tried those before, but definitely swing more towards the... Uh, oh gosh, what are the good ones? Light, Life. Life is very good. Uh, flaws and secrets, right. So we need a d12. Oh, love a d12. 11. <laughs> okay, this is, this is curious. This NPC's flaw is possession of forbidden law. They know something that is deeply troubling. Also Forrester Druid, dwarfs are the best. Can confirm. Play dwarfs all the time. <laughs> so let's see, so they pos possession of forbidden law. So that could even be... We can tie their weakness to their flaws. Gosh, my internet speed is awful. Hopefully this is looking okay and not too choppy. Uh, yeah. So we can tie their flaws to their weakness. That is something that we can we can dabble with. So maybe because of this forbidden law they know, that's why something holds their soul. A villain who is very protective of their family. Now I know how to mess with them. That's true. Much like um, much like Count Strahd von Zarevich, you can use that against them. If you wanna if you wanna try and draw this person out, then trying to find out who they're uh, who they're protective of can be very potent as a weapon against them. That's why I think bonds are really cool to have for both player characters and NPCs, because they can be used, one, as like a role-playing inspiration of what does my character think, and two, because you can target that. That's something that you can really use, you can leverage as a character. You know? Oh, thanks for the follow. Gosh, my notifications have just blown up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, if... If their bond, in the case of uh, one of the wizards I've been... Uh, one of the wizards. The, uh, the wizard character I play in a friend's game at the moment, 
they have a lot of interest in knowledge. They think that the most important thing there is is preservation of knowledge and arcane lore and esoterica. So an easy way to keep them... I fall back. I will after the stream, of course. Um, so one of the ways that, you know, you could play against her is, is, is to just be like, okay, you know, this... Ca uh, well, I don't even know what I'm saying. Like, uh, I think the one... Because that's in a um, Baldur's Gate campaign. Um, and the one sort of infernal pact she's taken is to gain more knowledge and to gain more uh, sort of... You know, information. She thinks information is a power in itself. So we've got using monsters as NPCs. That's talking about things like a Xanathar type character. But I think this works well as a human, uh, not, not specifically human, but a humanoid character. Um, not so much. Earlier on, I was thinking, oh, maybe it's a demon in. You know, in in maybe disguise, but no, I'm thinking this is very much a person. The question is, what kind? Let's see. I think Xanathar's guide might have some stuff on how to we can get further into this. It'd be a shame if your brother died falling off a cliff. <laughs> Okay, now I'm getting some stuff about this forested druid. <laughs> ah, so that's how it's going to be, huh? Go for the family. <laughs> Dear Count Strahd von Zarevich, we have kidnapped your your love interest. <laughs> Let us out of Ravenloft. Or it would be a shame if she fell on my daggers. <laughs> okay, let's get Xanathar's guide out. Yeah. Let's see, there's probably some tables in here that we can throw some dice on. Or if people want to throw out some suggestions of who they think any of this is, then please, by all means. I am open to ideas. Okay, so let's see. We need character options. This is your life. We've got character names we can roll on. So let's see if there's ideas we can work with here. Family, childhood home. Okay, so this is mostly, like, background stuff. I don't think it's super important. It's just to be careful, maybe you don't follow them back. You don't recommend following Ah. Thank you, Forrester Druid. I will keep that in mind. Supplemental tables. Here we go. Alright, so we can... Let's just roll a d100. So that's a 1-5. So currently we're thinking, thanks to Xanathar's, human. <laughs> uh, let's see, so let's put that... Let's go up here. AKA Player's Handbook 2.0. It really is! So, traits, and we can of course swap these out. Uh, let's go race, or folk, wh um, whichever you'd like to go with. Uh, we can put sort of, they don't really need to have a class, but I'm going to put like, stat block, slash class. And they'll basically give us how they act. So it could even just be, like, noble slash commoner. Um, you can work with a villain that's just a person. They don't need to particularly be a, you know, warlock of the arch fiend every time. 
So let's say character name. We should have a name for this. We should have. A, we should name our villain. Um, I've I've rolled on the table and it says human, so I'm going to tentatively put human. And I'm going to flip to the back of good old player's handbook. Sylvana. Sylvana's a good name. Gives me sort of an elven... Sort of a more elven uh, feeling as well. It's just got that sort of sylvan, like, fey sort of flow to it. Love I's and L's and A's. <laughs> Uh, let's see... <laughs> human names. That's... You can't just pick human... You can't just say, give me human names, and then be like, oh yes, let me just roll on this D100 table. No, no, you've got to go through the ten different tables of... Is it like a Arabic name, an English name, a French name, a Chinese name? Is it German? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what this region is like. <laughs> That would, that's not a bad idea. If we want to pick a region, sort of where we draw inspiration from, that's sort of a very common thing with um. What's it called? Uh, Van Richten's Guide to Everything, which is a big inspiration for my next D and D game, is um. For each domain of dread, it has like sort of the inspiration of where it comes from. Like you'll say like um, let's see, more uh, not mordant, uh, Lamordiae's um sort of German inspired, like it's a sort of uh, tundra version of like this sort of, I mean it's basically so that your mad scientist can have a German accent really, um, but there's a few of them there where it's like this place is inspired by sl uh, sort of more Slavic um, regions. But my GF is quite the dishonorable type, she's not above using underhanded tactics, so her influence already grow on me. I like giving this character. Let's let's go English for now. And we can always drop it. <laughs> you know what? Let's do on we'll we'll give it a coin flip here. On an odd number we'll go with a male villain. On a even number we'll go with a female villain. Let's roll D twenty. Odd. Okay, so we'll pick from the male names. I'm just gonna go English because I'll be able to pronounce every English name, and it will just work. <laughs> we need a D100 again. Uh, okay, yeah, 1-1. One, one. Uh, 11 is English Bernard. Our villain's name is Bernard. Oh, all right. Bernie, our bad guy. <laughs> Alright, uh, English, do we have last names? We don't. Okay. Oh, if we just roll another D100 and then see what happens. 54. Lance. Lance? Nah, Lance is more of a first name, really. What about female names? 54, was it? Helen. Also a very first name. Okay. Well, Bernard. Gosh, alright, I'm... I, f I feel like throwing another dice on the table just to see what happens. Uh, wow, Drogo is cool, but that's just Game of Thrones, right? Like that's too cool. Of, that's too cool of a name. You can't give a you can't give like a clumsy, weaselly person the name Drogo. It's too cool. <laughs> Not having it. I mean, I don't know if they're really Weasley, but I'm getting the image that this could be, like, the kind of villain that's just... I I recently just I finished um, running a Waterdeep Dragon Heist game where my villain is the Castellanters. And yeah, they're, like, not weak characters, but the, ins the idea behind them, the intent, is that... You treat them as you treat them not like Victoro is a high priest of Asmodeus or whatever, where yeah he's a dangerous stat block, 
But his most threatening ability is that he is a person in a position of power. He has money, he has wealth, um, he has influence over the tiers of society. Um, you know, your biggest fear with him isn't that you'll pick a fight with the guy, it's that if you do try to hit him, he'll call, he'll inform the guards, he'll tell the city watch, and they'll put you to death for in, for attacking a nobleman, because he's gonna, like, use his power to corrupt the legal system and just really crack down on you. Let me know if the stream is okay. I'm I'm staring at that little red block in OBS like oh boy, <laughs> you're scaring me. <laughs> if gosh, that's not like that's not all I've uploaded at the moment. Hardware's fine, but goddamn, Australian internet. Whoa. Daroth, Johnston, Bannon, Sylvia, Fena, Meadow. Daroth Johnson, Baronin, they're good at Sil what is it, Sylvia? You know what? I I'm not against. I'm gonna Forest of Druid, you've given me a good idea. I'm gonna copy your message there of those names. And I'm gonna go protective of close family members. I'm just gonna give it to you. And that's their family. So that's who we've gotta that's who we've gotta work with. That's who they're protective of. Um, heck, even we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six people. I'm going to roll these six, and whichever one I roll will be their love interest. Four. So, Sylvia, congratulations. You're now the most important one. Boop. There we go. Okay. We can work with that. I, I, I like what we're coming up with so far. So now, our villain Bernard. I'm, I'm not going to get over it, but you know what? It's kind of unsuspecting. If you're introduced to, like, this member of the sort of ruler's court, whose name is Bernard... You're not immediately going to, like, and he's just this sort of opulently dressed, you know, well-spoken, but like a bit clumsy kind of person. You're not going to immediately pick up that this guy is the villain of the game. This is kind of like a, in, you know, a, a stealthy, like, uh, you know, very corrupting force type of character. And I quite, I quite like that. This could be fun. <laughs> Hang on. Let's see. Monster Manual. Alright. We know that they're high in Charisma and low in Dex. So I'm going to take a look at the NPCs in Appendix B, B of the Monster Manual. And I'm going to see if any, of the, if any of these things fit the bill. Um, and we can just pull from one and stick it in the other. Uh, acolytes? They're higher wisdom, so they're gonna be a no. Banada. <laughs> See, that's what I want, though. I want the players to make fun of this guy. I think that could be really interesting. I think that would be really fun. I, th I think if they meet this character, and they're like, Pfft, Bernie, Banada, more like Berna stupid, and I think that's going to immediately, like, you know, the twist of, oh no, this one's been behind the whole evil plot the entire time, will be really cool. I like that. I think that could be really, really cool. You know, or that's sort of always the last one you expect type of deal. Let's see. So Acolyte is a no. I don't think they're a clerical person. I don't think Bernard is a is particularly wise. He might be wise. I think wisdom should be a good uh, a stat. He's got maybe slightly better than average. That or intelligence. 
Archmages? Not really. Assassins are really Dexy, so he's not going to be an assassin type character. Bandits? No, I don't think the bandit stat block really works. This person doesn't strike me as a fighter. Commoner? Commoner's fine. I think it should at least be slightly more than a four hit point, like, dead. At least a noble. Uh, cultists? Okay, so the cult fanatic could be a good option. So if they do have some sort of magical powers, but maybe they don't have magic. I'm I'm just going through this book and just spitballing. But maybe they do, or maybe they don't. Um, but cult fanatic kind of works. If we're going for a low tier character, then that's something we can work with. Once again, druid. Don't think so. Gladiators are stronger. You know, if he's a particularly well, like, well-refined, quite, uh, quite muscular, like, well-trained person, I kind of don't think so. Guards, knights, knights kind of fit. They've got um, low dex and high charisma. It's not their primary stat, but I don't really think any of the NP, uh, the NPC stats in the Monster Manual are high charisma classes. Um. Which is not hard, we can always swap that around. It's not hard to just go mage, sorcerer, and just flip his charisma and intelligence. Easy. Uh, so that's an option. Nobles? Nobles fit. Priest, once again, don't think so. Scout, spy. Spies are also high dex, but they are high charisma. Thug, tribal warrior, veteran. Veterans are just like knights. I'm going to just write, at the moment, noble. Yes, I have spelled that right. I had to double check, to double guess myself. So a human noble. Oops. Let's just save this. Good, you can't see it. Okay. Save it as villain and starting town. There we go. Okay. So I'm getting a picture here. So to recap, we've got our villain Bernard whose goal is to place a, uh, a pawn in a position of power. So they want to usurp the leader of this, of this town and place someone under their thrall in, 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 in the position of its figurehead. Their method of doing so is through neglect, because, as we've come to, the town is currently under internal strife, possibly because its ruler is a bit of adult. Who is probably quite boisterous, but an idiot. You know, that's a very common archetype, I think. Um, and it seems likely that this, uh, that the current ruler is likely to get themselves killed if, uh, if no one intervenes. And so the goal of our villain is to not intervene and to let, uh, is to let um, nature take its course. And for them to remove themselves, and his goal is to set himself up in, uh, is to set himself in a uh, up in a position where once our ruler has given th given themselves th uh, the door and our town has fallen into anarchy, they've already placed themselves in a position to usurp power. <laughs> We're coming up with something here. We're cooking with gas. This is cool. So we know that they're a human. We know that they're of, not specifically noble ruling class, but they are of some import. Um, we know that they wear particularly flamboyant or outlandish clothes. They're pro likely a very colourful character. They're very charismatic, so they're very persuasive. They're forceful, a born leader, but they're quite clumsy and fumbling. Maybe they... Uh, Maybe they have trouble, like, they might be charismatic, but they might have trouble with public speaking, maybe. Um, I know you can be quite charismatic and still stumble over your own words. They're great with animals, which is like, I feel like that's quite a little quirk in there. I'm not sure how well that ties into our narrative, 
But maybe they just really like dogs. <laughs> That's entirely possible. You know, it could be something fantastical, like they train hippogriffs, or they ride griffins or, or owl bears. But it could be something as small as he really likes ferrets. <laughs> um, his mannerisms uses colorful oaths and exclamations, maybe in, uh, you know, in in speeches often might uh, use like metaphor or um, or simile or might call on like he might be really good at using like image of the gods and such to try and um, present an idea he might just curse with like incredible powerful exclamations you know very argumentative though so I I can picture that that make that just makes sense. So they're willing to push their argument um, very strongly. They will like they're they're the kind of person who will argue until they've won the argument. It's not about um, reaching. It's not about reaching an accord. It's about pushing through and convincing them. They are captivated by a romantic interest who is named Sylvia. Um, and that is the thing they consider most important to them. Number one, their goal is they want to uh, attain power. Two, and maybe even the thing that might... Uh, these might compete with each other, and it could be a balancing act for this character, is this captivation with a romantic interest. Whether that's returned or not is yet to be seen. And fi and on top of that, they are protective of a close fa of their very close family members. So Daroth, Johnston, Bannon, Fe uh, Fainar, and Meadow are perhaps like father, mother, brother, son, uh, or whatever, uh, sister. So or, or even like it could it could be a detached family, like uh, sort of. Um, you know, cousins or something like that. It could be, you know, something removed. But regardless, these people are uh, important, and they will protect them. So their goal, uh, so one of their goals, is to make sure that no one interferes with their family, and no one in their family gets hurt. Or perhaps it's about preserving their um, their lineage and their legacy. So maybe they, maybe this uh, romantic interest is someone uh, they're very close to. Uh, maybe they maybe they have children, and as a result, their goal is like like uh, what I was talking about with the Castellanters and Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Their goal is to protect their lineage. Their goal is to make sure that nothing happens to their children, um, and that the sort of their last name and their like the, their sort of um, their legacy and empire lives on. But an important thing to remember. Is always their flaws, and in this case, this person possesses a terrible secret, which is that they're in possession of forbidden law. They know something they should not. They, on top of that, a hidden object holds the villain's soul. So, hmm, I think those two are tied together. I think flaws and weaknesses are kind of one and the same. Where flaws tend to be like a sort of character weakness. So it's possible that I'm tr I've been watching the the '90s X-Men cartoon, and so I feel like there's probably something tied to like sort of superhero origin stories. Um, you know, like maybe this might be something we explore in the next stream when we make a dungeon. But it could be like I'm picturing the Juggernaut right now, where he's got uh, he's got this incredible power that he's taken from this ancient artifact that he found, and by like taking the artifact, inserting the ruby into it, and speaking the uh, speaking the words, he becomes unstoppable. Um, and when another like archaeologist finds this uh, secluded temple and stumbles upon the tablet and the ruby and speaks the words. The Juggernaut loses the power of the Juggernaut, and um, and this new archaeologist gains the power. So we could have something like that, where this person has, in their quest for um, for power, or in their quest for um, 
for protecting their uh, protecting their interests, they've stumbled upon something that has given them great uh, great knowledge, but at the cost of their soul. Who? That's that's a good question. Who does their soul belong to? Do, do they hold their soul, or does someone else have it? I think that's an important question to ask. You know, I I think just as much as uh, Forrester Druid was talking about, um, one of their weaknesses could be exploiting their family and could be trying to get and use their family to get to them, and that might be a secret they tr uh, they try to keep. How much that how whether honestly I would even do the other way I think their family is something that is not a secret like that's something that's known I think they might even be this local like head uh, this local headquarters of a powerful family or guild I think that might be our family here so I think that's not a secret I think it's just something very important to them I think their biggest secret and the thing that will be easy to exploit is the fact that their soul is somehow locked away. Interesting. I'm liking what I'm picking up here. So we have a strong drink. Let's let's go back to the starting town for a moment. So we've got I'm going to say let's find out who this ruler is. So once again, where I'm going to go down, who is the ruler? The ruler. And we'll determine what the system of government is after we kind of determine who this person is. Were they put into this position democratically? Are they the most powerful uh, mage? Are they a religious figure? Um, let's find that as we go. I think the fact that there's a powerful family or guild could be an, um, an item of import here. Just a thought. With um, a powerful family or guild and a villain wanting to protect their family while also putting a pawn on the uh, into the position of ruler I think it might call the question of is that who is that pawn they want to put into a position of power is it one of their family members I think it's actually not I think that's another character that we don't know yet um, I think part of that protective nature is that they maybe don't want their family to get involved in this lifestyle. So that sort of protectiveness might be they try to keep their um, their family members out of politics or out of the sort of theocracy or majocracy of the city or out of um, or away from the monarchy and they don't want to get you know they don't want to get their sort of personal and um, and work lives sort of mixed up too much. You know, I'm Maybe it is a roman maybe it is the romantic interest. I once again, I don't think it is. I think they want to keep these. I want. Th I think they want to keep so these three worlds, well, four if you include their forbidden law. I think they want to keep all of this as far away from itself as possible, and they don't want to intertwine any of this. So let's find out about our ruler. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the NPC tables. We're not going to do the villain tables because that's. Bernard's roll here. We are going to roll on the bag on, on the NPC tables and determine what their traits are and who get the same sort of thing that we've got here. So let's up that. But we do know a few things about our ruler. The main thing that they're a doltish lout. So we provided we keep that at the core of their character then we can keep rolling on these tables and determine every other trait about them, hopefully. Or at least many of the things. So, we need... I really should have put... If I were a better uh, planner, I would have put some tabs in this book. <laughs> so 
so I could find these tables easier, but we're pretty close. It's after... It's after... Before... Before villains. Here we go. So our ruler... Alright, so, first up, we need a d20. Distinguishing characteristics. They have an un... Okay, they have an unusual ski uh, skin colour. Uh, let's do the same thing I've done here, of appearance... So maybe they're like, hmm, what could an unusual skin color lend to? We'll have to see. They might not even be... What Unusual for human is different to unusual for tiefling. It's possible that that could be part of an influence. They could be part tiefling, maybe. And that might explain why they have, like, unusually pink skin or something like that. We'll determine that later on. But we know that that's something they have. Which I think maybe we might even change that. Just because... It's once again we know that we have harmony between the different um the different folk of this town. So we know that there's not like animosity towards tieflings or goblins or whatever. So perhaps we might drop that because I feel like if that were if there were a different thing here that might cause I don't know. That might just rub people the wrong way. You know, like, oh, well, the tieflings, the humans don't like the tieflings, but this person might be part tiefling. But that's not really a thing we can really weaponize here. But let's continue on. So we know they have abilities. And when we say abilities and high and low, in the case of, like, a common or a noble, it might be a variance of, like, one or two. Um, just enough that it's a notable feature. It doesn't mean they're... An 18 in Charisma, which I think for Bernard it might be, like at least a 16, um, and like an 8 for Dexterity. PC level kind of stuff. You know, you don't really have that much more swing than that at a f like first level character. Um, and I think this is quite a low level town... I think this is a very low level encounter. I think this isn't a super high tier problem. I think this is a sort of more political and intrigue game that we're sort of building up here at the moment. So, our uh, NPC, a uh, ruler of this location, he has a high charisma! <laughs> so, high stat. Is, you know, let's just copy to paste here. Whoops. So they're also high charisma. It's a battle of the charisma casters. Not really because we're not using casters, but you get the point. And they're low stat. It could be that they're just opposites of each other. Like, they're just reflections of one another. They both have high, uh, high charisma, low dexterity. I want it to be different. Three. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> it's the one that no one makes particularly low. It's not Von Constitution. So, low constitution. This could actually be part of why their skin color is unusual, honestly. A low constitution tends to mean that you are sickly and pale. Perhaps they've got like a slight yellowy, greeny tint to their skin, like this sort of pallid. Um, sickly expression, like they're always sort of a bit, maybe they're a bit, uh, have that sort of like jaundiced look about them. Um, maybe, maybe that's part of what our villain can leverage. Maybe they look ill. Maybe they're, maybe they are sick all the time. And it's this sort of known thing that, uh, uh, that the ruler is, uh, potentially like, oh, he's, he's always sick. Is he on death's door? We don't know. Like, that's the sort of thing for historical rulers to have had a lot, where like, you know, um, where, well, yeah, where an heir would step into a position and they would be 
often ill or anemic or like um, not particularly strong. But of course, everyone has a talent. Not a talent. A talent. What is the ruler good at? Nine. <laughs> oh, okay. That's fun. They're great at impressions. Once again, not sure if the talent is super tied into the narrative we're telling. You know, it would have been a whole different story if they were a skilled actor and master of disguise. But nope. They're great at impressions. <laughs> Or impersonations. Sickly, always in bed, but man, he does a great impression. <laughs> Have you seen his Bernard impression? Oh, it's bloody good, in it. <laughs> he sounds just like you, Bernard. And of course, he has mannerisms. Another D20, of course. A n -n 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 19. Ooh. Not an uncommon one here. They bite their fingernails. It's another thing that you can just kind of. Want. Once again, these things kind of inform roleplay and inform the image of that character. Like, mannerisms, if he uses colorful oaths and exclamations, people might think. You know, take note of that character. You know, if they shout an exclamation, BY MORADIN'S BEARD! You know, it paints a picture of this very, like, flamboyant, ostentatious character that at the same time is a bit of a klutz. And here we've got, like, yeah, the idea of biting their fingernails is just something you can rattle off. Like, their fingernails all have that, like, you know, ja like that sort of jagged, like, bitten nature to them. I'll just tap down a little bit. There we go, so we can just see what's going on. Okay. Interactions with others. So let's put interaction traits. And once again, this isn't how they treat everybody, but it might be how they treat the party, or might be sort of their go-to mode. And for that we need a d12. A 1! I'm going to re-roll. Actually, well, that gives us argumentative. Agua. Argumentative. So we've got another person that, once again, there's sort of like an opposites nature going on here, like same but different thing between the current ruler and the villain, where both are charismatic, um, both are a bit of like, have that sort of clumsiness, and like we've got this dolt and like a bit of a, like he's a bit of an idiot kind of. With the ruler as this doltish lout, he's loud, he's possibly obnoxious. Um, argumentative might be the case. You know, if they're both particular, like maybe the villain doesn't particularly get along with the ruler. Maybe their ideals and um, and nature at, uh, are at odds against each other. Maybe he's lawful and Bernard's evil. Uh, not evil, chaotic. So we've got a bit of their eternal champion like law versus chaos instead of good versus evil. Maybe Bernard's not particularly a bad guy. Um, maybe he's willing to do good things for selfish ends, or perhaps evil things for a good ends. Let's see. His ideals. I think his ideal is independence and is a chaotic ideal. I think our ruler should flip it. I think while Bernard's a klutz and our and our ruler is sick, I think he should be a lawful character, um, which makes sense being in the position of law. 
I think this person should respect the rule, uh, sort of the rule of law and the edict of um, of, of order. Uh, so let's go. They have lawful ideal and a d6, a one. Their ideal. And I'm going to put lawful in brackets, but their ideal is community. Just one word that kind of tells you a little bit about what they what they aspire for. Um, so in this case, community. Um, so independence tells us that Bernard is a bit of a free spirit and doesn't want to have... doesn't want other people's wills forced upon him. And our ruler has this sort of more community bent, like sort of it takes a village kind of mentality of maybe people have to work together. Um, it's it's just different forms of government. We're crea I didn't think we'd get a uh, political intrigue going on. I thought this was going to wind up being like, Ah, oh, yes, our villain is a vampire who lives on the castle on the hill. No, we're, we're getting, like, this sort of just diplomatic incident. Um, I think that's fun. I think, that, I think that's new and exciting. Uh, community, so that is a lawful ideal, and independence is a chaotic ideal. Too often you have um, you have games that are just good versus evil. You know, a lot of games are sort of Lord of the Rings, where you've got a you know the heroes must defeat evil, or the players are playing villains and must defeat good or defeat a greater evil. Um, but you don't really get that eternal champion, lawful and chaos a, a, a clashing, and our characters. Who knows what they represent? Whether they are representatives of law or chaos, or are about like Eternal Champion, the balance between or the neutrality. I think the most common alignment I end up typically playing, and I'd be interested to hear what um, what people think that what people make of theirs. Like, what is your most commonly played alignment? I think mine might be lawful neutral. Um, I think I wind up playing that a lot more than most. Uh, my first character was lawful neutral. Um, the characters I'm, uh, what my probably my most time spent playing a character uh, was whoop, was a character named Gunner Firefist, who is a legendary character in my group. Um, I love that character. Um, he's lawful neutral. I think when we uh, when we end, like when we last played in that, or when we finished that campaign, or where we left off. I think he was about to swing into lawful good territory. I think he was finally turning around where he was a previously quite a greedy merchant character. I think he was starting to weed off that and turn into a good person. Um, in my current games that I'm pl a player in, I've got my wizard Evelina who's neutral. Um, just for, uh, middle of the road, neither lawful nor chaotic nor evil nor good. Um, and I I put like on when I pitched this character to the dungeon master I wrote a uh, I wrote a line from the book a thousand uh, from the book thousand suns and I just said uh, I I think my pitch to that for that character was the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance and that's sort of my influence for that character where um, where she knows that good and evil are tangible physical things, like in hell de devils are made of evil, physical actual evil but for a person on a personal level I think she believes that the ignorant are are sort of the, are, are sort of a more pressing form of evil like a more societal evil and that preservation of knowledge is the most important thing and that, like, uncovering a lost secret and gaining knowledge that has been lost for thousands of years is more crucial than, say, an individual's life, I think is her mentality. Contrast that with my character in, um, in a friend's Saltmarsh game, 
Brawl Hellwinter, he's neutral evil. And his, uh, his sort of mentality is being a sort of pirate, like he's literally a cat, like we have a ship in that game and he's the captain. Um, his mentality is everyone else is unimportant, the only thing that matters is my crew. Um, so he's so he's evil, where he would destroy everything for six people, <laughs> and they are the most important, and everyone else can go screw. Hey, Jeremy. Welcome. OMG, you are right, OMG. We're, we're building a town, we're building people. This ruler feels more like a jester. He, he's a bit of a clown, he's a doltish lout. He's loud, probably a bit obnoxious, boisterous, some might say. It's possibly like he's upside, like that might be uh, why he's got this position of people thought he was funny. Who knows? You know, strange things have happened in the world of politics. <laughs> Let's see. So we've so coming back to our ideals. Sorry, that was quite a long tangent about about my characters and their alignments in D and D. But I think it's I think alignment is a really really interesting starting point. Like a lot of people, have, a lot of the discussion of D and D has so sort of skewed around like moving away from alignment, and it kind of has. Um, and I think alignment should always be like less prescriptive of your character like when I first started playing D&D &D, a lot of the conversation we had when deciding what our characters would do is like no your character's lawful evil that means you shouldn't do that thing and since then me and my so gaming groups have since put alignment as more of a descriptive um, thing which I think is should be the case where it's something that grows and changes with your character like your character bonds should change over time um, I maintain that like every now and again you should go back to update your character sheet and maybe your personality traits have changed I think character growth and character gr uh, character changes over time are very impactful um, your bond might change and you might no longer care about some religious relic or uh, the place where you grew up it might not be import as important to you anymore it might be more important that one of the player characters in the group saved your life and you feel like you owe them a blood debt or something like that I think like alignment shifting over time so like good characters becoming neutral or evil and evil characters shifting into neutral and good um, I think that's very powerful and starting off playing an evil character that over time becomes a good character can be a really compelling story. Um, it's something that I've always sort of been interested in, is like, is playing a character that goes on that moral journey of uh, learning what it means to become the hero. That's that's an anti-hero story, is just the reluctant adventurer or the person who doesn't give a damn about anything, you know, about doing the right thing, growing and becoming a person who's this is how the Industrial Revolution started. Mm. Um, what, what was I just saying? Yeah, having a character that, uh, on the path of redemption, is, is a compelling story. <laughs> Moving on, what a tangent. I, I, just, I just love this kind of discussion, though. I think this is really important. Um, his, or his, her, it bond or bonds in the case of Bernard so our ruler their bond let's find out we need a d10 is a one interesting okay we're back to the interesting they want they are dedicated to fulfilling Filling a personal life goal. They have a thing that... Th 
that's a little bit un like non lawful, which you can have characters behave non lawfully and be lawful, but that's a very like individualistic uh bond, which I think once again similar to how we've got this person wants this and their bonds may conflict with it, I think once again this could be something that conflicts with their duty as ruler. Um, that could be fun. Let's find out what their flaw or secret is. So we need a D12. Oh, love a D12. <laughs> An eight. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Flaws and secrets. Lawful good, my actual alignment, or lawful neutral? I think my actual alignment IRL, I'm pretty sure, is a lawful good. I I think I relate to that as a person a bit more. As a character, I don't play... I've played a few lawful good characters, but it's not something I typically swing towards. Um, played nothing but a chaotic neutral bard. Yeah, that tracks. I I can tell once again my my stream is probably buffering. It's way behind uh, chat again. I can tell because we've just had those messages come up. All my DMB. Jeremy, I wonder how many times you've played a chaotic neutral bard. Is it just the ones, or have, or is this like an archetype you fall into a lot? I get it. I play a lot of dwarves and a lot of wizards. <laughs> Sometimes both. My first character was a dwarf wizard. It, it's something I have feel a great amount of attachment to. Being both. <laughs> IRL. <laughs> I don't have escapism. I just play me. <laughs> no, that is not true. Uh, flaws and secrets. So we know, what was it eight? So flaws and secrets. They have a specific phobia. I was hoping for something that might fill in a little bit more of what their bond is, <laughs> but nope. It's a delightfully unspecific, specific phobia. So I I throw out there for ten minutes from now when the chat catches up. Let me know. <laughs> God, I need I need to sort that out. Um, I had it fixed last stream, but once again, I've changed my settings. So, no, I have no idea what's going down. Um, but let me throw out a, a very specific phobia, and that'll be what a ruler has. Whether it's arachnophobia, or a fear of heights, or maybe something relevant. You know, like something that might occur in a fa in this uh, fantasy land. So maybe it is arachnophobia. Um, you know, that would be awful if this person encountered dr uh, encountered like a, a conflict with the drow. Um, terrifying. They use spiders in war all the time. Um, maybe it is. Maybe it's a fear of the sea. Or I don't know. I I like coastal towns, but we can throw that away. Fear of flying. If our um, if our villain Bernard here is in fact a Griffin Rider, he could use that. He could be he could exploit that weakness. Who knows? And once again, I think I'm going to put there. So race and stat block. How do I write here? With a hyphen, really? Okay. Stat block slash class. I think for the for our ruler, no class, no player class. I think I'll just give them noble so they can survive being hit once with a cleaver. <laughs> but if an assassin gets them, they're got. There are better. I should have brought out some more books here. Um, if I'd gotten Volo Volo's Guide to Monsters and. Um, uh, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes have a lot more like NPC stat blocks, and I should have brought those books out just to flip through. Um, but they've got things like war clerics, champion, uh, yeah, champions, warlords, which I think might be a little too high tier for this. Once again, I'm thinking this one is quite political, it's low tier. I think this might take place in a decent sized city. 
Um, maybe, maybe even water deep size, like big, a city, not just a settlement. Um, this could even be an urban campaign. When we get to our next stream and find out what the dungeon's going to be, um, it could be that it's that the dungeon that we use, like this uh, first adventure for our players, might be a sewer or a ruin under the city. Maybe this city is built on top of another city, and we'll discover that later down the track. Um, I, I think that could I think that could be really cool. Or we might leave the city and go into the wilderness, and maybe that's part of. You know, I don't think we'll learn everything about these characters today. In fact, I think we might even be wrapping up soon now that we've got these core concepts down. I want a name for our no uh, for our noble, um, and I think I want to I think I want to figure out the identity of one more NPC, which is who is Bernard using to put on uh, to put into this position of power. I think those are our things we need to get down today, and then next stream we'll find out what. Um, what is going to be the nature of our adventure. So we're going to figure out... It, this might even take another... This might even take three streams in total. So it might be the next stream we find our uh, we find out what our dungeon is and let that inform what's going on um, and where the players are going to go. And then we have another stream to sort of flush out more of who the key players are and what the adventure structure might be. We do actually have more tables, more random tables in the DMG to figure out how this plot is going to manifest and what our inciting incident might be. So that could be like, what is session one? So I think let's make one more. In fact, let's give this, let's figure out who this character is first off. Let's get the ruler and let's figure out uh, we have a table in here somewhere, if we just go far enough. It's after the Sorceress Origins, and after all the stuff about your character. It's somewhere in here now. Here we go. So, this person, a supplemental table, the ruler, we know he's lawful. And we know, and we'll now know what race. Six six. <laughs> it it's not a devil. Um, it's not the number of the beast. It is a halfling. A sickly little halfling. Status dead. <laughs> no, they're very much alive right now. They won't be in the future. And now, so, I mean, we have a halfling, so let's go for the halfling names table. Easy. Um, let's find out. I'll do the same thing. Uh, odds for a male character, evens for a female name. Like, that's of a... Uh, name will go. So once again, another male, uh, another male halfling character. So we'll go for the halfling male table in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Plug, plug. It's the only thing I play. Hey! If you find your niche, if you find a character type that you love, play it. A friend of mine really loves Paladin, and every time he plays something that isn't Paladin, he wishes he just played a Paladin. <laughs> like, that that's just how it be. Like, if you really like that thing where you're like, yeah, I love a high charisma ca uh, character, and, you know, this support abilities and magical secrets is just the thing I get, then Bard kick Bard's awesome. I... I've got an odd relationship with bards, honestly, now that I think about it. I've played them... Gosh. I think I've... Yeah, there is a delay. There is definitely a delay, I'm aware. I think bards... I've played bards maybe two or three times across multiple campaigns. And I've wound up not... Somnophobia. I'm going to have to look those up. Um... And I've ended up not playing bards in those campaigns. All right, let's see what these specific phobias are. I, l I like what I'm hearing right now. Som somnophobia is a fear of the dark, right? Somnophobia. Extreme anxiety of oh, and fear of... Oh, the thought of going to bed. That's interesting. 
That's really interesting. Sleep angst. Uh, nephrobia is also known as hypnophobia, clinophobia, sleep anxiety, or sleep dread. That's cool. Sleep dread sounds interesting. What is dragon craze? Also, hi, dragon craze. What does dragon craze think for this character? It's the fear of palindromes. Word of the words that are the same backwards and forwards. <laughs> that is very specific. I actually really... I kind of like this. I like both of them. I, I think I'm going to take both of them. Um, and we can lean on one or the other, but I'm going to put them both down. Because I just really like these ideas. So we have... I... Ibophobia. Ibophobia? And we have somnophobia. Ah, oh, right. Te uh, tenebrous is, uh, is dark. It's somnia, is dream. Um, so, let's go for... Put both of those down. Because those are fun. Um, it's the fear of palindromes. Words are powerful. I think. Um, I mean, <laughs> words have power in a different manner of speaking, but using it as a using it uh, using it in like a weaponized way in palindromes could be uh, could be interesting. Um, I don't know how, <laughs> but I'm I'd be interested in finding out. That could be an interesting to, thing to explore. So I'm gonna put them both down. A, uh, a ruler, this of uh, sovereign, being both like, t you know, ter like sickly and bedridden, but terrified of going to sleep, sounds cool. I like that idea. I, I had, I'm unfamiliar with sleep dread, but I think after this stream, I'm gonna be digging into what that's about. Let's see. So now we need a male halfling name. Once again. Roll a D hundred and you'll find a name out seven zero. Neville. <laughs> the ruler. Neville. Is that yep, we have halfling family names as well, so let's find out what that is. Sixty two. <laughs> Neville Smooth Hands. How do you sp yeah, just double H. That's that's rare in uh, in language. I I think I don't know where I've ever seen a double H in a word. So that's fun. <laughs> there we go. So now we've got our <laughs> our, our particularly sickly Neville Smooth Hands ruler, who I think is. We'll discover. I th I think next stream we'll dig into uh, more about the politics because now that's that's something that I think is important here. I'm gonna write down. That I think it is a sizable settlement. Let's go large. We'll call, we'll call it a city for the time being. Um, we m once again that one I think we can I think we can be flexible on the size and the um, the politics political structure I think we can so sort of figure out what that is later on if it's ibophobia there should be an NPC that only speaks in palindromes oh. Oh, that's fun. That's really cool. I don't know what that character could be, but that's fun. <laughs> I think there's, um... There are, like, demonic characters in some fiction that only speak in, like, rhymes or riddles. So you could always do something like that. Like, have a, have a character that maybe... Demonic or even Fey. I think Fey would lend itself to speaking purely in palindromes, which really limits you on what words you can use. <laughs> like, I I feel like trying to role play that would be nightmarish. But I'd love to give it a. Sh I'd love to see someone give it a shot, or I'd love to try that. 
I I think uh, coming up with an NPC that specifically only speaks in palindromes could be uh, could be an interesting experience. Um, so now let's create a character, and you know what? I'm gonna put it up here just because they're important to our villain, and we're gonna call them the pawn. So this is the character that Bernard wants to place in the position of power. Um, and we know nothing about this character so far, so we're going to discover them now. Uh, they do not have... They are not a villainous character themselves, I think is important. They might be evil, but they are not the villain. Um, so they themselves do not have a scheme. So once again, we have race and stat block we will discover as we go. I think this could do it. So we need to up the size. And let's just change the font, make it a little more noticeable. Boop. And now we need to find out who they are. Does this one only speak in palindromes? They might. <laughs> so, once again, we need our NPC tables out. This is working. Love some NPC tables. They're, they're, whoa, you can create so much with this. You know, a lot to think about. So we need Master of Adventures. And I'll definitely think over this um, in the time between now and the next stream. And I'll probably, just to be safe, I'll upload this to YouTube as well. I'll export it. Um, so people should be able to watch the VOD later. Alright, let's find out who they are. So, first up, I'm just going to copy all of this. And then just trim it back down into what we need. Uh, we don't have a second bond on them yet. So let's find out who is Bernard trying to use. First up, we need a d20. 16. Oh, that goes under appearance. 16 is a nervous eye twitch. Don't need to capitalize everything. Twitch. Okay. So they just have a tick. That's something that is. That's something that just is like with the rest of them. Something physically notable. Something you uh, will will notice after a time of interaction with them. Um, then they have a high ability. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> Everyone's charismatic. This place breeds charismatic people. I. You know what? I think I'm gonna use my uh, my veto here. No, screw somnophobia. It has to be hyperphobia. You can't throw away your answer now, Jeremy. I'm gonna put them both down because they're interesting. Um, you get you you can't throw out a cool idea and then put it away. I think I might re-roll this one just so we don't have everyone is high charisma. I think this one might be a, might lend itself to being something else. Um, whether it's a physical or mental stat, let's find out. One. Once again, if you've played D&D, &D, you know what a 1 is. They're strong. Oh, it should be, they have high strength. Which in this case means a high strength character is powerful. Physically, not yet uh, politically. So they are powerful, they are brawny. And they are strong as an ox. So, this, once again, it's just, I'm getting like a guards-guards feel from this, where 
He's trying to supplant a new king, and the new king will be clad in shining armor with a beautiful gleaming sword, and he will use it on the dragon, and the dragon will go away. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit Terry Pratchett there. Of, yeah, if we just give like we, we just need a a new monarch who will show up on the doorstep one day, and our villain will really be the actual king. Uh, and their low stat. What is their low stat? <laughs> it can't be strength. That has to be a reroll. They can't be high strength and low strength. Uh, that's cool. That's new. So a low five means their low stat is wisdom, which I was kind of... I was hoping for either low intelligence or low wisdom on this one. I think ha being uh, low wisdom... So let's go into that one, actually. Low wisdom means they are oblivious. They are absent-minded. I think the... L I'm, I'm curious as to, like... Your good stats are just as influential, I think, to character as your low stats. And I'd love to hear what people's, um... With their experience, what they most often often put as their low... As their lowest stat. Um, I think that's... I think that's very interesting. I think my characters most often tend to have low wisdom. Um, I think... Which is not entirely, like, you know, I play an idiot every day in real life. Um, so I tend to have low intelligence myself. Um, but low wisdom is is a very interesting idea. Like, my first character was this wizard who was high intelligence, but low wisdom. Um, he was also quite strong and uh, high constitution, having, like, those buffs from being a mountain dwarf. So he actually wore heavy armor. Uh, which was a really interesting way to play a first character of like, oh yes, I shall play a dwarf battle wizard. Um, back when there wasn't like, you know, this was when 5e had first been published and there weren't things like War Mage or, um, or whatchamacallit, uh, not, not Battle Rage, the other thing, uh, Blade Dancer. So he was a transmutation wizard because I thought transmutation was cool. <laughs> <laughs> like if a friend of mine um, started playing a dwarf wizard who's a um, abjuration wizard, and it's a way more solid build. It makes way more sense um, because it's like a high strength, like heavy armor, difficult to kill build who throws up shield all the time and counter spells. They're like an inquisitor, basically. Um, but I was just playing like a guy that could turn wood into stone for a short time. Um, but it was a really interesting way to play that character. But low wisdom meant that he was very unaware. And while being very... And, and even my current wizard, Avelina, she's got uh, high intelligence. And, and, like, um, and, and a good dex. But her strength is in the gutter and so is her wisdom. Which I which I play as like, she's uh, she's she's like physically frail, um, but quite nimble, and then on top of that is, she's got that sort of lack of introspection, that lack of insight. So while she might know a great deal, she doesn't know what she, she's not aware of what she doesn't know a lot of the time, um, and she can't really, and she's not a very good read on people. She thinks of things very factually. Um, my first wizard, he thought of... He he was intelligent, but the way he uh, I played up low wisdom was he would miss the obvious. He would always go with the most complicated solution to any given problem. Um, he would never... You know, throwing a fireball into the room was not, a, was not a clever enough solution for him. I, I could... I could... All day, I can sit here talking about my D&D characters. I can spitball this forever. But I'd love to know what other people's uh, lowest stats are. I once played a wizard <laughs> who had a negative 2 in constitution um, for a one-shot where we were level 14, and I think he had 44 hit points total. <laughs> he got hit by a... Uh, in the first encounter, we ran into a giant who threw a boulder at him, and he hit the floor. <laughs> I think it was like the first hit of the uh, of the game. Like some people attack giant, giant through boulder, wizard hit the floor. <laughs> he didn't even get around. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. Very, uh, you don't see uh, low constitution often. That's why I thought it was very interesting when our monarch had a low constitution. It's a rare occurrence. Um, not a lot of people... Like, it's from like a sort of, you know, playing smart kind of way. Constitution is always kind of your top th- one of your top three stats. Just so that you have hit points. Like, that's crucial in a game about traditionally fighting monsters. So you don't often see people be like, but what if my character is really sickly and frail? <laughs> you know, low charisma is fun. You know, that can low charisma can manifest in many ways. I've seen that played in in, in an abundance of directions where, like, um, that might manifest as they're just an asshole. Their personality is very grating, and people don't like them. Um, I've seen it manifest in a way that they try really hard and people just, and, and like the DMs in it, they just sort of glide off and bounce right off them, like people don't like them, they don't make much of an impression. My character Gunnar, um, who was a gunslinger, um, his low stat was charisma, and the way I did it was, he just wasn't very good at public speaking. He could, like, any argument he made was good based on, like, it was... Anything he did was very logical, and it was very direct and to the point, and he always made a point of, like, trying to do what's best for all parties involved, being, a, like, this merchant. And he just wasn't very good at getting his point across. He didn't speak very clearly or very well. He he kind of talked out of the corner of his mouth and didn't really make a good impression a lot of the time wasn't very good at convincing people of his point of view. And that's just kind of how I played him. But cr- Charismatic But charisma translates to size, and that's what matters. <laughs> Not always. There's, um, I've seen, like... And even, I think, like, first edition D&D had this precedent of, like, um, the anti-paladin either had maximum charisma or minimum charisma, where their stat would be like 19 to 20 charisma, or it would be 1 to 2. Um, and the way that would manifest is either they're devilishly gorgeous, like have unhumanly beautiful looks, like the sort of slanishy, like, too uh, perfect uh, appearance, or they would be hideous, like there would be a grotesque figure. And I don't think that's really how... You could play it as, like, charisma is looks. I don't think it is. I don't think charisma really is... T- I, don't th- I think charisma is more of a force of personality. Um, it's your character's sort of belief in... in themselves. Like, a charisma saving throw is... to prevent you from being possessed or banished to another plane of existence. It's kind of like this self-assurance. So I think charisma is very much a mental stat entirely... And it's not tied to the physical. Personally. Yeah. Like, I think a character that's not traditionally beautiful can be very charismatic. It's mostly the way you deliver yourself and, like, the confidence that you have. I think a character can be drop-dead gorgeous. Like, you know, granite chin. uh, (laughs) You know, like, incredibly beautiful. And still have, like, a four in charisma because they have a hunch, or they, like, you know, they don't hold themselves with a great deal of confidence, they don't speak well, um, they don't, maybe they don't have, like, that, like, once again, bards are typically very cocky, um, and, like, cocky, charismatic, and, like, self-assured traditionally, and I think that's part of what charisma is, it's, like, this sort of self-assurance that, you know, you that like this sort of swashbuckling, like not all the time because rogues and uh, not rogues, um, sorcerers and warlocks are also uh, charisma uh, charisma classes. But I think there's sort of this rakish nature to charisma. Now, of course, the pawn. What is their talent? Their talent is roll a d20. 13. I don't think we've rolled a single, like, 20 today. That's on brand for me. Ooh. Ooh. I like where the pawn is going. He's a fun character. Or he, he, she, they is a fun character. <laughs> so, 13, their talent is 
drinks everyone under the table. Which is really on... I think this person is definitely, like... I think they might be a... I'm just getting an image right now, and this could be way off when we get into who they are. But they might be, like, a sort of local of this town that people really like. I think they might be a well-liked person. Um, but they're a bit of a dolt themselves. Like, they're this low wisdom, like... They're not super bright, they're a bit oblivious and a bit absent-minded. But they're a huge guy, or a huge person, buff as hell. Um, and, of course, our town is known for its strong drink of, a uh, of laughing spirit. Um, so I think there might be, like, a sort of drinking culture, maybe. Strength is always the one I care least. Strength is commonly let, uh, left to the wayside. I think strength, aside from, like, characters that specifically roll strength, like melee fighters or paladins... Um, barbarians. I think typically strength tends to get left behind. My last D&D um, &D game, the one I just finished re like last month, um, had four players in it, and all of them had less than ten strength. They all of them had their worst. Uh, you know, a lot of them made characters together, and they all came up with this super low strength party, which actually came up later on in the campaign when they th they thought that the entrance to this dungeon. Um, they were just too weak to pull up because I was having to make rolls when it was just a fake entrance to the dungeon and it's like a fake trap door that they thought was just too heavy for them to lift when really it doesn't go anywhere. It's just like a plate on the floor that's every time you touch it, it triggers a trap and they kept going for it because they're like, I'm too weak! <laughs> you know? I, I saw them all come up with low-strength characters and I immediately said like, man, you guys are lucky it's Dragon Heist, not Dragon Hoist. <laughs> Mannerisms. Twelve. <laughs> Who is this guy? Who is this man's mannerisms? Prone to predictions. Um, it's twelve, right? Yeah, prone to predictions of doom. I foresee my own death, annihilation everywhere. <laughs> they might be the worst person to put in this position. They might be an easy toady. We'll see. Let's find out their interaction trait. So this is how they will interact, probably with the party. A, a nice baseline for them. Oh, that's too perfect. A two. At least they're not argumentative. They are arrogant. I think that might work. Uh, useful knowledge. We, I wish there was, a, there was a table for useful knowledge. That would have been cool. We can we can play with that later. Uh, so now we need an ideal. Now we need a table to roll on. So we need to pick. We've got a chaotic character. We've got a lawful character, and then we've got the pawn who is being used by the chaotic character. So I think their alignment could be anything at this point. They might be... I think they're probably an unwitting pawn, based on the fact that they've got quite... they're an arrogant person, they're low wisdom. Um, I think they're an un... I think they're being unwittingly used by our villain. Um, so I don't... Th so I don't think they're necessarily evil, and I'm not sure if they're entirely chaotic. Um, I think I might lean away from lawful, just because that's the role of our ruler. And so conflict is always interesting. So having them be a noticeably different person. Also a bit of adult, maybe. Um, so maybe they're not too... Di like, maybe it's not too much of a far cry to swap these two rulers around for instead of a sickly... That might be the image here. Like, they're painting the uh, current ruler as this sickly, ill halfling... And swapping it out for this big, burly uh, whoever, who's a, also a bit of a moron. Who's a bit of a sort of loud, obnoxious, you know, asshole. Who knows? I think we're painting a picture here. But I think this person, 
should either, should probably be, I'm going to roll a d6, and I'm going to put this in the other ideals table, because I kind of like what I'm seeing there at the moment. That or neutral. I think having a, I think having a pawn in neutral could also be a good idea, so I'm going to roll this and then pick a table. Five. Neutrality or redemption? Hmm. I think that could be int I think that's a, I think that's curious. Good and evil puts it as retribution and respect. I'm gonna put this under neutrality. I think I think this person's kinda towing a line here. Neutrality. <laughs> neutrality. I have no strong feelings one way or the other. Tell my wife I said Hello. <laughs> neutrality on the neutral table. Neutral neutrality. The neutrality for neutral. Cusco's poison. The poison for Cusco. All right. Then their bond slash bonds. Uh, what will we get? It's a D10. What does our pawn character care about? They are. Ooh. Ooh. This could be. This could be something we can dig into next stream. Their bond is they are drawn to a special place. What that special place is, we'll have to find out sooner or later. That could be a, a temple to a certain religion. It could be a fane to a dark god. It could be the dungeon that we're going to create. It could be a house, like... It could be it could be a tavern that they have a specific connection to. Um, once again, open to suggestions. Um, you're welcome to throw those in chat or into the comments when this is uploaded. Like what, you know, you're welcome to throw out ideas um, into the comment section or like what 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 do people do? Do people think something here sh should be swapped out or what do they think some of these nebulous ones should be? Um, but let's find out what this person's flaws and secrets are and finish building this character. Let's find out who they are. So, D12. A 10. Oh, this is too perfect. So their flaw and or secret is they have a secret, uh, secret crime or misdeed. And it's finished. There we go. That's how their fall comes about. That's how they're being used, is that Bertrand must know about this flaw. That's... I mean, honestly, using... Uh, you, like, to plant a monarch, having leverage and blackmail might be a good way that they can manipulate them and get them into this point. Maybe they know that and they're saving it. Like, that's not the thing they're using directly. They're trying to play more manipulative at first. And if it's a last resort thing, they're going to go all the way and use this secret crime that they're holding up. Maybe Bertrand, with his enorm with his power, being a member of this uh, powerful family or guild, maybe he's part of a cover-up. But, now that we've got all of that, let's find out what we're working with here. So, who is... Our pawn. D100 coming right up. 1 6, 16. Human. Human is pretty common, so I'm not against it. Humans and halflings, halflings and humans, they go hand in hand. You can't change my mind. PP scales, scales with charisma. Yeah, you can you could you can put that if you like it. <laughs> That's usually just something I leave up to the player. Like, if it somehow comes up, which I don't think it ever has in any of my games, but you're welcome to declare it. Um, I remember watching High Rollers way back when, like the Yogscast um, D and D Twitch stream, where <laughs> uh, one of the characters decided, like, what if I roll a d20 and see where that lands me? 
God damn it, he rolled a 20. It became a running joke that he has an enormous schlong. <laughs> Their next campaign, he did again. No joke. <laughs> so, we have a human. I think... Stat block or class... I'm going to tentatively put... It, warrior isn't a real thing that exists in D&D. There's no 5e class for warrior. There's no NPC stat block for it. But it tells you an idea that they're a fighter. Um, which I think this person is. I think there's some sort of fighter. So you know what? Instead I'm going to put fighter slash. And I think we rolled for them to have a high charisma. And I said, no, let's re-roll it. And we got strength. So I'm willing to give them still a few good points in uh, Charisma as part of their drop from Wisdom. And I'm willing to say they could even be a Paladin. I think a Paladin um, NPC could be a good uh, a good route to go. Um, being a Paladin might mean that this drawn to a special place could be a place of religious importance. Um, so I'm willing to leave the door open for that. I think there are probably some, like, Paladin-esque stat blocks that I can dig for in these books um, to use. But I think I think that could be an interesting way to go. And I might even, later down the track, once we're done here, uh, create a temple um, for this town and have that be a place of note. Now that we've got a residence, we've got a tavern, um, Maybe a way, maybe I'll throw up a few more buildings in here later down the track, and we can see what are the places of import in this place. Where are the players going to go? Um, and maybe one of them will be a place of religious importance. And I think that, once again, I want to get... There are a few things that we're kind of missing here. There's a few building blocks, and I'd love to hear what people's opinions are. Um... But I think a bit of that's going to hinge on the dungeon that we need to create. It could be a place of a dark god that has now stolen uh, our villain's soul, or it could be a place of um, a, a place of religious importance. It could be heck. It could just be the sewer <laughs> that we don't know. But let's find out what our pawn's name is. So we need to roll on another table. It's gonna be something human. I don't know what kind. We've got Arabic human, Celt. You know, we've got a we've got an English human. Let's go for something that's not English but kinda has roots in the same. Kinda has similar roots. So English has romantic languages. So Slavic's out. Let's let's say let's roll a d100 on the Roman. Ma uh, did we? We haven't decided if this character is a uh, is a male, female, or what. So let's do the same thing. Odd, even. <sighs> Another male character. Okay. I was really hoping we'd get a few more female characters of import, but we'll have to rely on our heroes. A. Eh? So. Let's see what the Roman male table gives us. And if it's something stupid like Marcus Aurelius, we'll give it a reroll. Uh, Roman male. 87. Octavius. Eh, Octavius is pretty cool. That's a big... That, that's a name, I'd believe, on a big, strong paladin guy. Once again, not married to it, but... I think this one should be like a... This character should have like a sort of strong, cool name that they're like, yeah, that's the guy we want ruling the town. Like, you know, they have to have some gravitas to it. Unlike Be unlike Bernard, who's kind of laughed at and like skipped over a bit. Um, but I'm quite happy with what we've done today. We've been doing this for 2 hours and 15 minutes? 2 hours 10 minutes-ish? I... There's so much more we can do. Um, there's so much more we can do with this, but I really like what we've got so far. It's some cool stuff. Um, Neville Smoothhands. Got some really, really unfortunate names. Um, but I like where this is going. It, 
I once again, I didn't expect it to be quite so like politics and intrigue. But I'm happy it did in a way. This is fun. This is cool. I the closest thing I've run to a political game was Waterdeep, where even then that's more of like a sort of heist swashbuckling adventure like some political intrigue is there but they weren't really playing politics despite it having like noble families being the villain um and being quite engrossed in it it was still a bit of a factions game and this is a whole different story and i like i like where this is going um but i think that'll be the end of the stream there I'll I'll see if I can leave the um the stream ending card up just a little bit so that chat can catch up to the end. But that'll be it. Um come back later. We've got I'm going to sort out my uh, I'm going to sort out my settings before next time and make sure that they're right so there might be like a little practice one in between. But we're going to do another stream where I'm going to use a tool called Dungeon Scroll to draw a map um of the player's first dungeon. So where this adventure is going to go. The only thing missing is if the poor was bastard child and is now a world from Game of Thrones. It's got a bit of a Game of Thrones, like, once again, fantasy politics. And that's cool. I like fantasy politics. That can be a really cool way to go about it. Yeah, my vocabulary's shrunk down because I'm having too much fun. Um, but yeah, next session, next time, we're going to figure out the rest of this adventure. So we're going to start by making a dungeon... And that's going to be, once again, as much as we can, rolled on random tables in the DMG, and they've got a whole bunch of tables, and we can just go as far as we like to come up with a town, uh, with a dungeon. Maybe let's not go too big with it. I probably won't make a macro dungeon, because that's a lot of time investment, a lot of rooms, but also because this is probably going to be a low-level encounter. So this is going to be something maybe level 3, I think, is kind of where I'm picturing this adventure. Um... So we're going to have like a dungeon built up and we're going to find out what this important location is and what's there, what the treasure is, if our villain's soul is there or not, we'll hopefully determine. Um, and that'll come up with a lot of details about the rest of it. And then we might even have a third stream after that. But he only predicts Dooms when he's drunk, which is hard to achieve because he's got strong tolerance. <laughs> got to slug back a lot. Um, so we might even have a third stream after that where the goal is to try and get everything else fleshed out. So try and get more of our town. We still don't have a name for the town, so we're going to have to come up with something for that. I was hoping to do that once we have more details about it, but I'm glad that we at least have our sort of three core NPC characters. Um, now that we have those, we can figure out a lot more. Um, I still want to figure out the political structure. I, I'm a little disappointed we didn't get through enough of the town, but at least the town inspired the people in it. Um... But, yes, so tune in for the next stream. Um, I'll be posting... I'll, I'll post more when uh, before that happens. Um, hopefully there'll be a video in between now and then. But we'll we'll see. It's It's been a bit of an ordeal to get everything put together, get my computer put back together. But I will see you all next stream. Let me just oh, go back to OBS. Bye-bye.